Good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to participate in their workshop today. The title of my presentation will be Unknown Identifications Using NIST EI Hybrid Search. Resources found on my personal website include today's workshop presentation and a workshop handout with links to resources on my website. Free training courses on both the NIST EI and MSMS hybrid searches are also available plus a variety of other presentations on mass spec techniques. My experience in unknown identifications was obtained at my time at Eastman Chemical Company in Kingsport, Tennessee. Eastman Chemical has 50 manufacturing sites worldwide and we employ a variety of mass specs that are networked for problem solving. I'm a retired research fellow from the company. I have 42 years experience there and six years in my consulting business. My passion has always been unknown identifications using GCMS, LC, MSMS, and other techniques. An article in LCGC outlines Eastman's approach for unknown identifications. The article is entitled, Identifying Known Unknowns in Commercial Products by Mass Spectrometry. In many cases, someone knows the identity of my unknown I just need to find out that information, thus the term known unknowns. I did not coin this term, it was actually stolen from Donald Rumsfeld in some of his talks as the former United States Secretary of Defense, and the quote is shown above. We have many tools in our toolkit at Eastman to identify known unknowns. Sample history and known components in the mixtures are very helpful. Commercial MSMS and EI libraries are used with the NIST search to identify them. Accurate mass analyses. Spectralist databases such as CAS Registry and ChemSpider. Chemical ionization GCMS for determining the molecular weight of unknowns that do not show a molecular ion. Training courses that we use internally on the NIST EI and MSMS search software and that now we also supply online on my website. Extensive EI and MSMS corporate user libraries that are shared and update automatically nightly. We use NIST MS interpreter for fragmentation, NMR, infrared, and synthesis of enriched samples by known chemistry in one to two gram quantities for confirmation by NMR and mass spec without purification of some of the proposed structures if necessary. We use deuterium exchange CIGCMS and infusion MSMS for determining exchangeable protons. This can be very useful for differentiating two structures that differ by the number of their exchangeable protons. Derivatizations for GCMS, in particular, we do a lot of TMS derivatives, trimethylsilyl, and that's very useful because NIST has a lot of derivatives in their libraries that they supply that can be useful for identifications. Known unknowns can also be identified with spectralist databases. In general, these are ones with no associated spectra. We summarized our work in this area in two articles in the Journal of the American Society for Mass Spectrometry for SciFinder and ChemSpider. For these two databases, there's a huge number of records in them compared to the spectra available in mass spectral libraries. You can see above that there's about 1.2 million in the available various libraries of EI and MSMS compared to about 50 million records in ChemSpider and over 127 million records in CAS registry with about 15,000 added each day. Kim's Spider is free, but there's a fee for the use of the CAS registry using SciFinder. One can search Sci Kim Spider and the CAS registry by molecular weight or molecular formula. The CAS registry is only searched though by molecular formula which is somewhat of a problem for in some cases where compounds are approaching 600 or more molecular weight because in those cases it's difficult at times to get one distinct molecular formula. Chem Spider, on the other hand is searched by both accurate mass and molecular formula. 
but you'll get a lot of candidates from these searches, so you have to refine them by the number of keywords, the number of associated references, substructure, etc. The final candidates are then reviewed using fragmentation, sample history, etc. to hopefully get down to one st structure or possibly two. Complementary NMR data is used with mass spec for identifications very often at Eastman. NMR is very useful for mixtures when utilized with structures proposed by the mass spec. Components confirmed can then be quantitated in the mixture by NMR and used as a, as a standard for calibrating other routine chromatographic techniques. Primary standards are not needed for quantitation by NMR when an internal standard is added to the mixture. High field NMRs are normally employed at Eastman, but they can be expensive to purchase and to maintain. New low field tabletop systems use permanent magnets and much lower associated cost. The latter type are limited in sensitivity and resolution, but I think they should be very useful for many applications now utilizing the high field NMRs. I would now like to talk about the main topic of my presentation, which is the novel NIST EI hybrid search. The NIST reference to their work is shown at the bottom of the page. The hybrid search generates a similarity score matching fragments and neutral losses. It greatly extends the scope of the library, and the mass difference must be confined to a single region of the molecule and no significant alteration of fragmentation behavior. Delta mass is one of the main results that comes out of the search, and it is the molecular weight difference between the query and the library compound's molecular weight and reflects the modification of the molecule. My personal experience is that I've used it for about 40,000 searches in the last three years in evaluating new EI library spectra for NIST. I'm routinely amazed by the types of similar compounds with high match factors that are noted. It frequently yields useful results not noted in simple identity searches, and it's very useful in identifying unknowns, finding similar model compounds, and supporting fragmentation mechanisms. The hybrid search combines scores of a standard identity search with that of a neutral loss search. It first searches the unknown standard spectrum against the library spectra and generates a standard identity match factor. So we just take our standard spectrum and search it as normal and it tells you how well it fits to that of all the library spectra. But then it searches the unknown neutral loss spectrum against the neutral loss spectra of all the library entries. You can see a neutral loss spectrum here in the bottom. We start with the low mass going to the high. Here it tells you the difference between the highest ions in the spectrum and its fragments, and that's looking at the comparison of the losses as, as opposed to comparing the fragments. When it gets through, it generates a combined hybrid score that's shown in the results. Let's take a look at a hybrid search results for an unknown. So our unknown is in the bottom left corner. The first hybrid match factor shown in the table is 908, and the next closest is 781, so a big difference. So this is probably our best candidate here to give us information about our unknown. As I said before, the delta mass is very important. It's 18 here, and that's common for fluorine because fluorine has a mass of 19. And if it was replaced by hydrogen, mass 1 on the ring, then the difference would be 18. But one can also look at the standard identity results in addition to the hybrid results because this was obtained and it notes it in the table. So you need to resort the hybrid search results by standard identity search max factor as opposed to the hybrid factor. And you'll find when you do that by clicking on the column O match to resort, you'll find that the top 24 hits contain the substructure with a fluorine and a bromine on the benzyl group to give the ion at mass to charge 187. Even though the match factors are very low, when you consider it with respect to the hybrid factors, it gives you additional information about the molecule. And that's in many cases, you get similar results when you do hybrid search 
by finding substructural information by resorting the original match factor. So let's mentally merge the information of the hybrid and the simple identities EI search. So we start with our unknown spectrum, and we know from the hybrid the best search result is the following compound on the top. We know from the identity search part of the results that it has a benzyl group with a bromine and a fluorine. And so if you put them together, you get the proposed structure for our unknown identity. But it could, have, could of course, be an isomer of this. This was actually a purchase compound, but it just wasn't in the current databases. It was being added by NIST. So I had it somewhat as an unknown to show as a test case here. Let's take a closer look at the middle display that you get from the hybrid search results. The top is the unknown, and the bottom is the hybrid spectrum. In the bottom spectrum, the original ions in the gray are shifted by the delta mass, 18, for use, user visual comparisons. It can take a while, I admit, to adjust to this view versus the standard head-to-tail views, but after a while, you get used to ignoring the gray because that's the ions that it shifted, it leaves ions that it doesn't shift in color on the bottom and creates these new ions that it shifted in color and it essentially takes the colored spectrum on the bottom for the hybrid of the best fit and compares it to our unknown to get the match factor and you can see that it would be very similar if you did that. But when you're getting started, I often took an alternate comparison of the hybrid spectrum. I looked at it in neutral loss display mode. And again, the top is the unknown and the bottom is the hybrid. And to do that, you can go down and click within the display to show the neutral loss display here. And when you do that, it just shows the neutral loss. You can see we're zero at the top. We're getting larger and larger. We go on the bottom. This is a loss spectrum. You can see this does fit uh, very well. And it's another way to look at it. But it gets easier to look at the original color display. And I find it much more efficient to look at the original hybrid display after one gets experienced with it. The delta mass value is a very important result from the hybrid search. Thus, with the hybrid search, one needs the nominal molecular weight of the unknown species for it to work properly. And many EI spectra do not have molecular ions. About 20% in the NIST library do not. So the user must decide in several different ways what is the molecular weight of the unknown. You can let the program determine it automatically is one way. The user can propose it from logical losses at the higher mass to charge ions in the spectrum and enter the value manually before the search is obtained. You can do chemical ionization to determine the molecular weight if you have that capability. If not, there, there are two user values proposed by two different NIST algorithms within the software that can be utilized. While I was doing these 40,000 searches for NIST, I recorded some what I thought were useful hybrid delta mass values in a table. And that's about 600 values in the Excel spreadsheet now, and it's available on my website. So let's show some simple structures with delta mass values to give you a feeling for what type of things you might find out from hybrid searches. Note odd values of the delta mass mean the difference between your structure and the other structure differs by a nitrogen. So you have somewhat of a nitrogen rule like you have in EI spectra. And the isotope ratios or accurate mass values can be very helpful with redundancies. And of course, all these substructures can be part of a much larger molecule. So some examples. Here we have benzene versus pyridine. Our nitrogen rule kicks in because we have a delta mass of 1. We have a delta mass of 2 here, but in the second case on the right where you've added uh, a chlorine to the molecule and it differs by two fluorines on a molecule, the delta mass is 2, but of course you'd be able to tell that by the isotope ratios for the chlorine. One that I particularly find interesting, there's a lot of benzene type compounds in the NIST library, but not as many naphthalenes. But if you see a delta mass of 50, that means you're unknown has a naphthalene ring instead of a benzene ring. And here's kind of like a merge of two things. You have the aromatic of going from a benzene to a, to a naphthalene type species with nitrogen incorporated in the ring. But of course the 50 is now 51 because we've replaced it with one nitrogen so your nitrogen rule kicks in. 
The other thing that I we use a lot is the powerful NIST mass spec interpreter program which correlates ions to structures. The ions in color and black are explained by the program. So you can see in this our unknown spectrum when we put it into the NIST MS interpreter search we can see that almost everything is in black and the white ions are the ones that it doesn't know. There are also some yellow ions and those are due to rearrangements of some type. So again, the ions in color and black are explained by the program. The isotope ratios, I'm showing the isotope ratio here for the molecular ion for this species, which is shown this part of the spectrum, and it compares the color for the modeled for this compound for the observed, and it's very close, which gives you a lot of confidence in the unknown's identification. It shows logical fragments. It shows mechanisms for these logical fragments and relative fragmentation rates. And a detailed description of how to use MS Interpreter is shown in one of my free courses. The hybrid search can also be used for LC MS MS unknowns. So at the bottom we have our unknown spectrum, but you'll also notice something different here. This was obtained with accurate mass. And those accurate masses can be used to elucidate the structure. And also you can send these results to MS Interpreter for further interpretation also. The top is now our hybrid best result for the accurate mass, and we see that the 158 has been shifted over by a, by a chlorine, showing that it's added to chlorine and taken off a of hydrogen. And again, you can sort the identity search part of the hybrid search and resort it and look at what it tells you about the fragments. And it says the top 20 shows two chlorines on the benzyl ring. So the proposed structure is easily determined to be the following compound with some isomer of this species with two chlorines on the aromatic ring. The values in my Excel delta, delta mass table are only shown in nominal mass, but here I calculated to show you how accurate the data was on this. You can see the entries for the 40, 34 normal. There's several different ones that have that, but I manually added the accurate mass delta mass column in the example below and found that this is the closest one, 33.9611, uh, which is almost identical to the observed value of 33.9610. I would like to share a real-world example of the identification of a PCP-related compound. It was done by David Sparkman and myself of a white powder. The data was obtained and sent to us for a characterization, and we used the NIST hybrid search. We used spectralist databases such as SciFinder and ChemSpider, and we used some organic chemistry. We first did a standard identity type search on the unknown and the match, highest match was less than 600 and really no substructural information was useful that showed any consistency in the data and really it tamed no useful results. Then we did the hybrid search and the hybrid search yields one promising hit. The match is greater than 800 and the delta mass for the species is 54 as shown here and the structure is shown to the right. So let's look at the summary of all our mass spec results. The hybrid search indicates a PCP-related compound. PCP itself has a cyclohexyl ring, but our, un, our best fit of our unknown in the hybrid search ended up in, indicated a bicyclic type compound instead of the cyclohexyl ring here. The delta mass was 54 from the search results, but unfortunately that didn't match anything in our delta mass table. This is a much more difficult hybrid search problem than many of the ones that I've encountered. But the accurate mass data was very useful to indicate a molecular formula of C21H29N obtained by DART. The best match has a molecular formula of C17H23N which indicates we've added C4H6 to the best compound match in our hybrid search to get our unknown. And this gives us one additional double bond equivalent in the unknown as compared to the best hit in the hybrid search. So we start with it. It's got seven double bond equivalents. We've added C4HX. And where we've shown the red here, we now have three double bond equivalents here for a total of eight. 
for our structure. So you have to determine what this might be that's attached at this position in the ring. Well, what I did was I proposed some structures from the chemistry. I considered the chemistry to propose three structures, and it, I used the reference shown below for the chemistry that I found on the internet. And I found three commonly available ketones, the ones that I looked several different databases, several places, and the ones that tended to be the most likely and commonly available, I proposed structures utilizing them in the starting chemistry to form PCP-related species. And I used the following chemistry where you start with the ketone and you add it to this nitrogen ring to get the PCP-related species. Well, when you do that, here are my ketones. This is one, two, three ketones I picked. And when you do the chemistry on paper, you would get structures one, two, or three. Well, here are the conclusions that led to our identification of the unknown. The hybrid search was critical in suggesting PCP-related substructure. The delta mass was not easily associated to any definitive fragment in my delta mass table, which was a little discouraging, but it's a somewhat difficult problem compared to some that would be solved with the hybrid search. The molecular formula was a critical piece of information. It was obtained from the accurate mass DART data. Initially, using the molecular formula and double bond equivalents plus chemistry, we proposed three structures. The structure was confirmed to be one of these by NMR. The data we had so far was not good enough to limit it down to one structure, but the NMR showed that it was the anamantane type fused ring or bicyclic ring uh, that led to the observed spectrum of the unknown. This is somewhat difficult, this approach using chemistry, and a lot of people might not be comfortable with that approach. So later I wanted to see if we could more quickly have solved the problem using our data plus spectralist databases using ChemSpider and SciFinder. And I'll demonstrate that in the next couple of slides. Here are the results using the known unknown approach with SciFinder and the hybrid search results. We use the molecular formula search within SciFinder to find candidates. And as I said before, SciFinder can only use the molecular formula. It cannot use the monoisotopic mass, which ChemSpider can use in addition to the molecular formula with ChemSpider. The results of the SciFinder search for C21H29N were sorted by the number of associated references. There was 4,342, which was really just too many to be useful, and even the top hits, if you look below, the ones with the highest number of references, none of the high, uh, highest number sources of references had the structure that we had known was present by the hybrid search results, so the results really weren't useful in this case. So we refined the search by using no groups attached to the piperidine ring or the benzene in the SciFinder. And this, this approach was not included in our initial papers in ASMS, but it is a really nice addition to the method. We allow no substitution on both rings by including hydrogens and in a molecular formula of C21H29N. So you can see that we put hydrogens around the structure, which means that no substitution can occur in these places, which limits uh, branching from them. And when we got through using this approach, only two of the 4,342 results had consistent structures with our uh, requirements here in this substructure. And there are both actually two that we had suggested from the chemistry. And the one that had number one, which is shown here on the left, is the adamantane structure, which it actually is. And it had nine references and four suppliers. Result two had two references and zero suppliers, and that's one of the other structures that we had drawn from the chemistry. And we probably would have used this as the first one, usually the one with the most reference, references we consider first, but probably still would have required NMR to decide which structure was actually that of the unknown. So here's an, another alternate approach using ChemSpider using the monoisotopic mass 
and a similarity structure search. So in this case, we use just the monoisotopic mass, and I noted that that was a big difference between SciFinder and ChemSpider, Kim is that one can use the monoisotopic mass, while with SciFinder, you can only use the molecular formula. So I put in the mass that we saw, 295.230, and I limited the range of the precision of the measurement the accuracy, and I came up with 4,238 results. Again, uh, way too many to look through, and nothing really came up when I sorted by associate, associated references or databases, so no really useful uh, data. So I took this and decided to use a similarity search. It's called a Tanamoto search, and it's a type of search that shows similar structures. And when I did that and used this structure to limit it and also the monoisotopic mass, I crossed them to use both of them, I only came up with one result. Uh, which is the desired compound, you can limit this Tanamoto search by different values such as 90%, 80%, 70% uh, to get the desired results. But it was very interesting or very useful that we got the result, the only one result, which was actually the correct answer. I want to talk about the differences in the EI fragmentation of PCP related compounds. So I've shown here not the standard spectrum, but the neutral loss spectra for the three species that we've discussed. So we start here, you can see you start at the molecular ion, so it shows as zero, and then you show the losses here. As you look at them, the big difference you'll see is the PCP angel dust shows a big loss of 43 from the molecular ion that's not present as a neutral loss in the other two species, which somewhat surprised me that these wouldn't look more similar. The presence of the fused cycle hexyl ring drives this loss of 43 for this C3H7 neutral loss of the, of, not, of the uncharged species to give the fragment ion shown in the neutral loss spectrum below. The same mechanism for the loss of the 43 part of the molecule is not accessible by the other two compounds because you really have to have three carbons in a row. If you look down here at the bottom where our pointer is, one, two, three. Well, these really can't do that. So the bottom line, if the best hit of molecular weight 241, this compound that was imported in the hybrid search was not present, then the hybrid search would have failed to yield any useful information based on PCP-related species. It's just not going to work in the hybrid search due to the differences in the neutral loss spectrum. Well, here's a more detailed explanation of the 43 loss in the PCP EI mass spectrum of angel dust itself. And you can see that you have to have these three carbons with this hydrogen available here to rearrange to this other carbon that's three away to lose this C3 fragment to to yield the ion present at 200 in the mass spectrum. And also, Martin did a great job of also describing the fragmentation mechanism for the other two species that were shown in the previous slide. And those results are available on my website. So in conclusion, the hybrid search is a very valuable addition to the identification process. It extends the utility of all commercial and user EI and MSMS libraries one can take any of your libraries from other sources and there's a way within the NIST software to add the proper indices to do the hybrid search with those databases. It's used in combinations with other approaches to identify unknowns and free detailed training for EI and MSMS hybrid searches is available on my website. And that's a critical part of using it because you have to know how to set up the search initially with the proper parameters and then how to view the data and then also using NIST MS interpreter is a very useful part of the process and that's described within my courses also. On my website there are internet links to free resources that I discussed in the workshop plus many others and they're all in a PDF handout that you can click on the links and directly go to them. And those are the ones that we had talked before, the NIST uh, free training course, et cetera, the LCGC 
article, the spectralist databases. Uh, I didn't talk much about chemical ionization, but I have a very detailed description of how to do chemical ionization and the importance of s selecting the right gas or even a liquid for using as the reagent ion in those analyses. So that I think you'll find that very useful. And also the link to the NIST literature reference, it'd be good to read that. It's very, very good reference. And the trimethyl solid derivatives for GCMS, I have a very detailed description of those on my website also. But there are other things, methyl ester derivatives for GCMS. There are some differences. We have an Orbitrap, great instrument, but there are some differences between the standard EI spectra and Orbitrap EI spectra. Uh, helium conservation is becoming more important, and I've put together a lot of uh, detailed tips and advice on using helium such that you can conserve the gas. A simple way to monitor lipid matrix effects, that's something to do with uh, electrospray type analyses of biological samples. Uh, identification of surfactants, a lot of samples have surfactants in them, and they can be very complex mixtures. And I developed a way and taught a course at PitCon on how to do that with LCMSMS data. And also, the Wiley Know-It-All software training course is present on my website, and that allows one to use uh, mass spec searches plus other techniques such as infrared and NMR to use them together to identify unknowns. I'd like to take this time to acknowledge all the contributors to the work. There's a whole group of people headed by Steven Stein at NIST that wrote the software and have described the software and shown many applications of the software in the literature. I'd also like to thank Kurt Clevin and Adam Howard and Laura Aducci, who were some of my former colleagues at Eastman Chemical Company that worked with me on the NMR data and some of the uh, known unknowns for Kim Spider and SciFinder that was in, we published in the literature. Uh, Anthony Williams helped me with the Chem Spider. Uh, he set it up so we could sort by associated references when to use that as an unknown identification mechanism. He now works for EPA and has similar software. I think it's called a dashboard there that you might want to take a look at. And then Stacy Edwards, originally we didn't have an accurate mass instrument, so she was kind enough to work with us on the known unknowns in the SciFinder CAS registry work to share her instrument with her, with us so that we could do the work and we ultimately used that to convince our management to buy an instrument. So that was very helpful and I appreciate that. So I have some time left over in the session so I could take some questions now but if there aren't any questions that you'd like to ask at this point in time I'll do a real-time demonstration of the hybrid search software to show you how it works.